Is it this one? Yeah. Okay, um, yes, thank you very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here. Uh, my name is Tom Hans from the University of Zurich, and um, I'm going to be talking to you today about some work I did at the University of Leicester during my PhD with these guys down here. And that work is on um, breaking mu motion resonances during type 1 migration. So I mentioned two things there, type 1 migration and mu motion resonances. I want to give a quick overview for those of you who maybe aren't so familiar with those things. So type 1 migration, we've, um, we've got a nice little simulation of this going on here. So this is what happens when a planet forms in a disk around a young star. That disk is made out of gas and dust. You see um, the planet here in our simulation. Uh, it's a little yellow dot and it interacts with the gas in the disk. Um, you see it's driving out this nice spiral density wave here. And the planet will actually interact with the spiral density wave that it drives out. And um, the interaction with the spiral density wave talks the planet and causes the planet to move either closer to the star or further away from it, depending upon various properties of the disk. And um, one of the very interesting things about this process is that um, the migration scale, uh, rate scales linearly with the mass of the planet. And what this means is that if you have two planets in the disk, say a lower mass one here and a higher mass one somewhere further out, the higher mass planet will migrate more quickly and will tend to catch the lower mass planet, which is going to be very important in a moment. So mean motion resonances, this is a, um, a dynamical phenomenon whereby um, if the periods of two planets are commensurable, and what I mean by that is they can be related by a simple integer ratio, say 2 to 1 or 3 to 2, um, then you get a very strong effect whereby um, eccentricity is excited between the two planets, but also the resonance will tend to maintain itself. And what I mean by that is simply that um, once you get two planets into this configuration, where say one planet does two orbits, for every one orbit another planet does, then it's very difficult to break the planets out of this and it acts as a trapping mechanism. So this is especially important if you have um, this convergent migration scenario I just talked about, where you have a large planet catching up to a smaller planet, and at some point you'll definitely reach a point where the periods of these two planets are commensurable, and at that point they get trapped in um, one of these mean motion resonances, and what that then means is we'd expect the planets to stay in this uh, mean motion resonance and we'd expect to observe them in these resonances today. So do we see that? Well, what I've done here is plot three of Kepler's uh, compact multiple planet systems, uh, semi-major axis here along the x-axis, and the uh, sizes of these points are simply the masses of the planets, and uh, the red line here is the orbit of Mercury couple of important things to point out. These things are super compact. They're mostly within the orbit of Mercury. And what that means is we'd ex expect them possibly to form further out in the disk where conditions are better for planet formation and then migrate inwards due to this type 1 migration phenomena. Um, you'll see that the planets are generally well ordered in mass. So the lower mass planets are closer to the star, higher mass planets further away from the star. And what that means is that we expect this convergent migration phenomenon to happen. And so the stuff forms out here, migrates inwards, and the higher mass planets catch up to the lower mass planets. And then we'd expect some of these planets to be caught in these mean motion resonances that I mentioned. If we look at which ones actually are, then there's these three in Kepler 32 that appear to be very close to a mean motion resonance, these two in Kepler 11 that appear to be very close to a mean motion resonance. Um, but in general, actually, most of these planets are not in mean motion resonances. So the question then is, if they did form by this convergent migration scenario, then why do we have a bunch of these things that aren't in mean motion resonances? And I mean, I've only plotted three systems here, but in fact, this pattern is repeated throughout the entire Kepler data. And so to get a handle on this and to try and understand better what's going on here, um, we set out to simulate um, this convergent migration phenomenon using uh, the Pluto code. Um, so we did high resolution model models of protoplanetary disks where we had two planets, a five Earth mass planet and a 10 Earth mass planet. And um, initially these two planets are just outside of the two to one resonance. So the period of the 10 Earth mass planet is about twice as much as the five Earth mass planet. And what this means is the 10 Earth mass planet will catch the 5 Earth mass planet and capture it in the 2 to 1 resonance. Uh, we use various different disk viscosities and we use a flaring locally isothermal equation of state for our disk. 
And the interesting thing then is what happens? Well, here I've got the period ratio between our two um, planets uh, for four different simulations, all with different viscosities. You see, as I said, we start them just outside the two to one resonance, then they migrate in inwards, the larger planet catches the smaller planet, and at some point around the exact commensurability, um, you see this, the convergent migration starts to plateau, and this is a result of the two planets being caught in the two to one mean motion resonance. Um, and so we would probably expect them to stay like this, or at least a lot of migration models have found this, but what we actually found in our simulations is that um, the uh, mean motion resonance can be broken here, and you see the two planets start converging upon each other once again. And so something is happening in these simulations that breaks the two to one mean motion resonance, and this can go some way to explaining what I just mentioned, that a lot of Kepler multiple planet systems don't exhibit these mean motion resonances. Um, so I've got a video here just to demonstrate this a little better. So we're in the frame rotating with the innermost planet here, and the larger planet whizzing around out here is migrating slowly inwards. You see the period ratio between the two here is dropping as time goes up, and these, this is the eccentricity between the two planets. And what you'll see start to happen is as we get close to the exact two to one resonance, the um, eccentricity of both the planets climbs at the uh, same time, and the eccentricity of the innermost planet here actually gets pretty high, of an order of few percent, um, before they break through the two to one resonance, and actually the, there's some oscillations and eccentricity associated with that as the disk damps the eccentricity back down. Um, now, it's not in exactly clear what's going on here, but there was a suggestion um, in a paper a couple of years ago by uh, Goldreich and Schlichting, um, where it was suggested that the, the eccentricity damping that you see here in certain, certain circumstances for given values of eccentricity damping can actually um, cause the breakdown of these resonances, so we're investigating further to try and understand that. Um, so that's me done. Uh, so the so in general, type 1 migration models in the past have overpredicted mean motion resonances. Um, however, what we've seen in these simulations is that disk-driven migration does not necessarily lead to permanent trapping in mean motion resonances, more like temporary trapping, um, and then some effects from the disk can break the resonances, and so then we, we would suggest that what you actually see in Kepler multiple planet systems is planets that stopped migrating somewhere between resonances. Um, we need to work more to understand this, but it's probably related to this mechanism I mentioned by Goldreich and Schlichting. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do we have questions? Yes, one over there. Uh, not in these hydrodynamical models. In a previous paper, um, we considered uh, with a sort of toy model of migration what would happen if you had a Kepler compact multi like Kepler 11 or something, and you um, had a Jupiter mass planet outside the snow line. And we did find that, in fact, um, the Jupiter mass planet will, will tend to break the um, further out resonances, like 2 to 1, and push things closer towards, say, the 3 to 2, 4 to 3 resonance which for systems like Kepler 36, where you've got a very tight 7 to 6 resonance, can actually be very interesting. So yeah, I think that's a, that's a good thing to look at in the context of these more complicated hydrodynamical models. Do we have one more very quick question while the next speaker uh, starts installing? If not, we can thank Tom again. And uh, now we move.